everybody. How are you? Yeah. All right. Um, it's cold outside. It's getting to be fall. All right. I am so happy to be here with you. I am going to start off by being in our society a little tacky, and I'm going to talk about money. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is something we all know, which is that in a capitalist society, money is power. The men have more money than we women do, and we ladies will not be fully equal with men until we are financially equal with men. We talk a lot about the gender pay gap, and I love the work that's being done on it. There are other pay gaps as well. There's a gender debt gap. There's a gender pink tax. There are many gaps. One of them, which I'm spending my life working on, is the gender investing gap, which can cost the women in this room a million dollars or more over the course of our lives. And yet, it's something we don't particularly talk about. For some women in this room, it cost us more than the gender pay gap. And we all know that that money, that million dollars, is start my business money, buy my second home money, buy my first home money, travel around the world many, many times money, leave the relationship that's no longer working for us money, where he or she just isn't quite as awesome as they used to be. And it's get your hand off my fucking leg money. Yeah. Look, I, I think one thing we know is in this amazing, infuriating, energizing, me too, time's up moment, one thing that united so many of the women was not that they were financially independent, but that they were able to speak up in part because they're financially stable. And so getting more money to women, I mean, we can say all kinds of fancy stuff about what my professional goals are, help women achieve their financial and economic goals. I want to get you more money. That's what I want to do. All right. Who is this woman up here speaking to us? I don't believe we know her. She's not in our industry, is she? Well, I could read you my resume. I've worked on Wall Street for the bulk of my career, just all a couple years of it. Um, I, <laughs> thank you for laughing. <laughs> I uh, was CFO of Citigroup. I ran Smith Barney, I ran the City Private Bank, I ran Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, I ran US Trust. I hold a world record, thank you. I hold a world record, hold your applause for the world record. I'm the only woman who's been fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal twice. <laughs> it was so much fun the first time I did it twice. By the way, just sort of pro tip, you know, when you're fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, there's one of two reactions you can have. One reaction is, oh my god, this is embarrassing. And the other is, score, front page of the journal. In other words, I'm sort of the investing and in Wall Street industry's pain in the ass. Let me tell you, I've been asked to tell you a couple stories, um, so I, I'd love to. So first of all, uh, back when I was a research analyst at Sanford Bernstein in the day, nobody told me back in the 1990s that as research analysts we were supposed to fall over each other to fawn over the companies we were following to be incredibly positive. And so I was sort of that negative Nelly that tried to speak the truth to power. When I was director of research at Bernstein, we did something that no one else did, which is that we were in the research business and the investment banking business. I won't drag you through the details of it, but suffice it to say that if one individual is trying to advise research individual investor clients and corporations, there is a direct conflict. These guys want to buy a stock low, these guys want to sell the stock high. Which one do you choose? And running Bernstein, I said, we can't, we can't manage this conflict. And so I took us out of the business. The business, we gave up millions of dollars of revenue. The business almost failed. Analysts were leaving us because they could make more money elsewhere. And then came the crash of 2000. Elliot Spitzer came in, read some emails from the big Wall Street firms, 
said, oh my gosh, these guys recognize they're screwing the little guy, and our business did this. I was on the cover of Fortune magazine as the last honest analyst. It was a bigger than life-size picture, I know, because I put my face up against it. <laughs> and it was bigger than me. <laughs> my second claim to fame is that I then was brought over to run Smith Barney. I went from running 386 people on a Wednesday to 40,000 on a Thursday. That actually went pretty well. I, you know, I was in amongst the 60-year-old white men. By the way, I love middle-aged white guys. <laughs> I've been married to a couple of them. I think they're amazing. <laughs> I mean, really. My current and last husband is, um, <laughs> I was actually looking at him yesterday morning before I flew out. He is so white, he actually glows. It's a, it's a really unbelievable quality. Where was I? Oh, right, so I'm running the white guys. And we go into the financial crisis. And it turns out there were products at Smith Barney that we had sold to our clients that were supposed to be low risk, that we analyzed, the team analyzed as low risk, that were supposed to, in a bad market, go down a handful of cents in the dollar. In a bad market, that market, worst I've ever seen, worst I ever hope to see, they went down all their cents on the dollar. I went to my new brand spanking new CEO. I sort of knew I was in trouble when he would never look me in the eye, but still I went to him and said, look, I think we should do something that is unconventional and really unprecedented. Rather than let our clients, you know, not pay our clients, not admit we were wrong, let them sue us, let them hate us, let the business deteriorate, let our financial advisors be embarrassed, how about we do something crazy and partially reimburse them? He said no. I did some more analysis, came back. He said no. I did some more analysis, came back. It got to the point where he wouldn't speak to me, so I would wait outside his office to talk to him when he came out. The board caught word of it. The debate went to the board. Pro tip, pro tip, important thing to take away, if all you take away from this talk is that if you take your boss on at the board level, you will be fired. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and I remember sitting there the night before talking to my husband and like, okay, best case, we partially reimburse clients and I'm fired. Worst case, we don't and I'm fired. <laughs> Actually, it was really interesting because a lot of people said you were giving up a lot of a great job, a huge office, a car and driver, an airplane, warm chocolate chip cookies, a lot of money. How'd you make the decision? And I'll tell you the way I make all my tough decisions is what would I want my children to see me do? And so I went to the board, I won at the board, we partially reimbursed our clients, and a couple months later I was fired. The guy they um, invited to leave, the middle-aged white guy they invited to leave the month before me, they gave him $42 million. Anybody want to guess how much they offered me? That would be zero, Cat. thank you. <laughs> so that's sort of my history. I could go on and on, ups and downs. But during a period of transition, after I stopped drinking heavily, finally got out of my sweatpants and put on some mascara. Sitting there one morning, putting on my mascara, and I had, do you ever have those big moments, that massive insight where you're sort of like, well, I mean, y'all are creative people, right? You know what I'm talking about. Does your, like, head shake? My vision shook. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm about to have a huge idea. <laughs> Does that happen to you? Because that happened to me, so I'm putting on my oh, man. And the idea that hit me was the retirement savings crisis is a woman's crisis. OK, little real talk, ladies. We live six to eight years longer than men. 80% of us die single. 90% of us manage our money on our own at some point in our lives and we retire with two-thirds the money of men. At that point, I began to think about this pay gap and how that can not only help us live better lives, how it actually helps the economy grow, how it's better for our communities and our families because we put our wealth back into them, 
how it's good for nonprofits because we give a larger percent of our wealth to nonprofits, but that it also, were we to close that gender pay gap, it closes the retirement savings gap by one third. And I began to think about the gender investing gap. When I Googled it later, there was nothing there. It was not being spoken about. But when I stepped back, I thought about my career on Wall Street and how at Merrill Lynch at Smith Barney, the vast majority of our clients were male, that you couldn't get rid of them. I mean, they wouldn't leave. The attrition rate was a low single digit percent, but that in the year after their spouse's death, women leave at a rate of 80%. And I began to think about how the industry didn't see, the women didn't seem to be investing as much, didn't be, seem to be taking to the industry. And I thought about all the reasons I had heard for why we women don't invest. We're, we're risk averse. We just shy away from risk. We're not that good at math, like the guys are. We're really not very good investors. It might be because we're emotional. <laughs> we need to have a relationship the warm and fuzzies in order to do it because we're women. I don't know, there's something about having a uterus that just makes all these <laughs> terrible things happen to us. And of course we need more financial education. Well, that sounds right. Of course we need more financial education. Oh my gosh, so do the men. We're not risk averse, we're risk aware. Funny, crazy, but women don't really like to take on risk if they don't understand it. And by the way, explaining it to us in terms of standard deviation and drawdown risk doesn't do it for us. We're as good or better at math than the guys are. We get better grades in everything than the guys do. Don't, let, don't tell the guys, we don't wanna make them feel bad. We're better investors. We tend to earn when we invest a 1% annualized better return than the guys do, which adds up to a ton over the course of our lives. Why is that? I think it's because the men are cursed with testosterone. <laughs> they tend to trade more than we do. They tend to fall in love with their winners. They tend to sell their losers at the wrong time. During periods of financial instability, they trade too much. Testosterone, it's a curse. In fact, there's research that show, by the way, I'm joking, guys. Again, been married to a couple of you, think you're amazing. There's actually research that shows on the trading floors of Wall Street that poor risk taking rises and falls with men's testosterone levels during the course of a day. <laughs> True. In a day, the, the most compelling research about the industry that is the core of our economy that is completely ignored. By the way, my industry, Wall Street, went into the financial crisis, white, male, and middle-aged, came out whiter, maler, and middle-aged. <laughs> Diversity has gone backwards. But that's a side note, don't get me started. <laughs> Financial education, right? That's one. Every Wall Street and investing firm that has a woman's investing initiative, if they're not busy telling us not to buy shoes but to invest the difference, then they're telling us, they're giving us financial education. And in fact, when we're asked what we want to help us invest, we women say financial education. We say it the first time we're asked, the second time we're asked, the third time we're asked, the 15th time we're asked, the 16th time. By about time 20, we at LFS have found, we finally break down and say, please God, don't give me financial education. Because what's more interesting than financial education? Everything. <laughs> Everything. But it's probably not a surprise that, these, that we, we, the industry believes these things about women because society gives us messages about money that if in fact we could go back 100 years and say, let's keep the women from the money, the things we would do. We'd start out when we were children telling us that the topic of money is tacky. Daddy, how much money do you make? Sweetheart, don't worry about that. That's not polite conversation. As we, in fact, we would get lesser allowances than our brothers for doing the same work. That is true. We would get poorer grades in math for the same answers. That actually happens too. When we graduate to our teen magazines and our women's magazines, we would definitely know the six ways to the perfect smoky eye. But when it comes to money, we would be infantilized. 
we would be given messages, there's recent research on this, that talk to us about money as to how we spend, we, we spend too much, we waste our money. Don't buy a latte, it, you know, save it instead. Boys, on the other hand, would be given much more concrete messages about money. We'd be given quizzes. Are you a carrier, Miranda, when it comes to money? Can you imagine Jim Cramer turning to Dylan Radigan on CNBC and saying, what is your money type? <laughs> we would be given messages that money is unladylike. There would be no amount of money that we could make it work that we would feel good about that we would be willing to tell our friends about, right? I just challenge you for a second. If you were to, to go to your best friend, or maybe the person you're sitting next to and you were to have a glass of wine later, what is the amount of money that you would feel good telling her? Because either you're making too much and you're sort of embarrassed that you're doing well. I mean, gosh, God forbid, what if you're making more than your spouse or partner, right? There's new research, even the millennials. Millennial females feel like if they make more money than their spouse or partner, they are emasculating him in a heterosexual relationship. Or you're not making enough, and you've wasted your parents' money that they spent to send you to school. There's no amount of money that's the right money. We would be in a society that started as a puritanical society. We would be much more likely to have sex with someone on the Second day, first day, third day. It's been so long since I've dated. I have no idea what date it is any longer. <laughs> Fill in the right answer for me, please. But can you imagine if on the third date you said, how much money do you make? Meow. <laughs> Did I just do that? <laughs> Cindy? There'd be no fourth date. And how in the world? Are we supposed to know how much money to ask for if we're not even allowed to speak about it? This is how we'd be kept down, but there'd be more. The money industries, we'd keep the women out. Wall Street, ah, maybe financial advisors. Maybe we have them 86% male, as they are. Maybe traders would be 90% male. Maybe hedge fund managers would be 95% male. Here's a good idea. Let's brand these industries, let's brand this industry as a meritocracy. The best rises to the top, the cream of the crop. And if it just so happens that 90% of the best folks for the trading businesses are white males, it's a meritocracy, heat-seeking missiles for returns. Except financial crisis. True also in the venture capital world where 95% of investors are males, and so we've kept women somehow out of these money industries, which means that women don't get as much venture capital dollars, despite the fact first round capital tells us the returns for businesses run by women are 63% better than those run by men only, but we get 2% of the dollars. Friggin' crazy and on investing. Would it be, then be any surprise that that industry does a better job for men than for women? And rather than blame women, if we take a step back, think about the investing industry as it is today. Beat the market, outperform, pick a winner. Who's your money manager? Alpha. CNBC is ESPN, right? It's a competition. The industry symbol is a bull. You're branding people. That's a friggin' phallic symbol. I don't know of a single woman who's like, you know, that bull speaks to me. <laughs> My favorite two brands are Tory Burch and the bull. It might as well say He-Man Women Haters Club right there. And so that rather than it is something inherently wrong about us. It's the fact that the industry has been built, I don't think ill-meaning, but been built by men for men. And so what I decided to do, first of all, when I first had this concept, I'm like, oh, the gender investing gap. Well, look, I'm not an entrepreneur, so I'm gonna take this to some of the big bank CEOs, and I'm just gonna give it to them. I'm gonna say, hey, there's this gender investing gap, 
And it's not that women don't have money. We control $6 trillion of investable assets. 90% of us manage our money on our own at some point. So it's a huge market opportunity. But let's do some deep research into what will motivate us to invest. So I went to the CEO of one of the biggest banks on the friggin' planet. We had breakfast. He's a friend of mine. And after I went through this whole thing, $6 trillion, don't invest as much, 90% manage their money, on he looks off into the distance. And he turns back to me, and he says, Sally, that is so interesting. But don't their husbands manage their money for them? And I said, didn't I just say 90% of us manage our money on our own at some point in our lives? And so I went out and got my share of that 2% of venture capital dollars that are allocated to women every year and founded Elevest. If I'd actually known how difficult what it was we were going to do was, I probably would have wept first and then done it again. But it's been fascinating. We did thousands of hours of research with women like the ones here. And what we discovered are a handful of things. You are, so I started off, you know my bias? I started off with, I think we women have emotional blockages around money. And so I think we should do like a Cosmo quiz to get through the blockages and get us to invest. And so I spent real money on this and um, real time. And uh, the women did this to me. And sort of said, I do have emotional blockages, but I'm not interested in solving them with you. Instead, what we found is that we women tend to be very practical. We don't care about winning. We don't care about outperforming. We're super busy. What we want is to get from point A to point B. I have this much money. I want to start my own business in five years. How much will I need? And can you get me there through investing? I have this much money, I want to retire at the age of 60, 55, 65. Can you get me to a badass retirement? I have this much money, I want to have a baby. That's us. Be a fiduciary, put my interest ahead of yours, you tell me. Don't, I don't care about the fancy money manager. I don't care about taking on more risk. Just get me there with the minimum risk, and you please do the work. I want you, Sally, you said, to be the only investment platform, the only one, that takes into account that women live longer than men do, super important for retirement planning, just as gender bias falls you know, for medical issues, right? We think about it as being men. So my industry thinks about retirement as a male thing. We're the only ones that take into account the unfortunate reality that our salaries peak sooner than men's do. Very upsetting, but you better take it into account. The good news is that all the work as a digital first investment platform compared to all the others out there that started, the betterments, the wealth fronts, the sig figs, all the personal capitals, we have been the fastest from a standing start. We launched two years ago, the day before the election, because we were going to have a female president. Amazing. <laughs> standing start to 100 million, now 200 million of assets under management, fastest to those numbers of any of them. Because what we heard from you, thank you. because we focused in on what we are looking for, because we are you. We are a company today that is two-thirds women. Our engineering team is 50% women. People of color, 40% of our employee base. We are the only ones that represent and reflect you. And it's not, don't worry, it's not for lack of experience. I've got decades of it. My chief investment officer has decades of it. Our head of compliance has decades of it. Our head of operations has decades of it. And then we have a whole bunch of 24-year-olds who tell us how dumb we are, <laughs> who provide the spark and the innovation and the creativity. And what we're hearing from so many women is you're finally meeting my need. And by the way, why would I want to put my money 
with an industry that hasn't respected me or where I wouldn't want my daughter or my son to work. It's hard. I wake up at 3.30 in the morning with an ill-defined sense of dread every day. Because what we are doing is so important. And we are the ones who are doing it. We are the first to have taken women seriously. My friend Cindy Gallup, I quote her everywhere I go, right, about how much success there is to be had if you take women seriously. And we really are working to do that. We also are offering, and the only ones, 86% of you have said you're interested in investing for impact. That you don't buy the old Wall Street, you know, belief that you can either have impact or you can make money. You've said, nope, we want to multitask. We want to make money, and we want our money to do, do something important. And in the case of Elevest, that important thing is often investing in other women. I'll admit it, I thought gender lens investing was dumb. Investing in women, why would I do that? Except, I'm already gender lens investing, I'm just investing in men, who again are amazing, except we women, when we run companies, we have higher returns, we pay back our loans to a greater degree, we can be just a better investment. And so beginning to intentionally move our money to support other women is a win-win. When I said that we women, by not investing as much as the men do, even without closing our gender pay gap, are losing a million dollars over the course of our lives, some of you are like, oh. Others, you're like, yeah, that just feels, I don't know, I can't deal with that. So let me get it to some very concrete numbers for you. How much it costs you a day. So let's say you're making $85,000 a year. You're putting aside 20% for your future, which is what experts tell you to. So you are getting it done. And you put it in the bank. And you wait to invest. You know, it's going to take a while, even though at Elevest it can take 15 minutes, but it's going to take a while. I got other things to do. I got laundry. I got to get that raise. I got this issue at work. So you wait. Costs you $100 a day. Not in the first days, but because of compounding over time. Now, let me ask you a question, Cindy. If you were to have a hole in your purse and $100 fell out today, and then $100 fell out tomorrow. And then $100 fell out the next day. And the next day, and the next day. How long would it take you to fix your purse? Wouldn't take you a week. You'd do it today. And so what I'd love for all of you to do, I've got a special present for you. It is to give you that day back, that money back. I want you all to go now, dur you know, during a break, tomorrow, et cetera, I know you've got your things you can write down. I want you to go to elevest.com, E-L-L-E-V-E-S-D.com, slash three, the number, percent spelled out. You can there get a free financial plan, the most sophisticated, in my opinion, out there, that I used to sell when I ran Merrill Lynch for $1,200. And you can get some of that, we'll give you a gift to give you some of that money back. Because guys, I've learned one thing during all of this crud of the past few years, which is we women are so powerful. We've got $6 trillion of investable assets that we control by ourselves. We've got another seven with our spouses and partners. We're inheriting 70% of the $40 trillion of wealth transfer. We direct 80% of consumer spending. We're more than half the workforce. I'm not sure how we got convinced that we are weak and that we had to play the man's game. And when we did, we made no progress in moving forward. The gender pay gap did not move, despite each of us feeling individually empowered. The way this works, is for all of us as we've done in Me Too and Time's Up and changing Uber and changing Nike and changing the New York Times and changing the venture capital industry is when we come together and openly and wholeheartedly support each other because our strength drives change 
and it's good for us individually, it's good for the men in our lives, and it's good for our daughters and our sons. And so this is why I'm doing what I do, because I'm going to give my life to get all of you more financially healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.